Like the black-robed preachers of the 18th century, Dan is a pastor who boldly proclaims the principles of liberty from the pulpit. Dan is the pastor of the thousand-member Trinity Baptist Church in Yukon, Oklahoma, while also serving as a member of the Oklahoma House of Representatives. As a leader of the modern-day black-robed regiment, Dan recently released his new book, Bringing Back the Black-Robed Regiment, which documents daring deeds of the original patriot pastors who stood against British tyranny. Here to present Liberty or Death, What the Founders Did, Bringing Back the Black-Robed Regiment. Please join Give Me Liberty in welcoming pastor and state representative Dan Fisher to the stage. Good evening. My name is uh, Peter Muhlenberg. In fact, my full name is John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. But because of my fiery temper in my younger days, my enemies and friends called me Devil Pete. See, I was a Lutheran pastor in Woodstock, Virginia. Now, we pastors climbed into our pulpits every Sunday wearing uh, wearing our preaching robes and our preaching scarves. We'd break and open open God's Word, and we would hammer away. Now, of course, we understood that the most important thing is the eternal salvation of a man or a woman, and so we would constantly remind our people, what have you profited if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? But because we believed that the gospel was the most important thing, we believed the second most important thing was to defend the liberty to do the most important thing. So we, looking through Scripture, saw that the Bible had a lot to say about government and all kinds of other subjects. We would preach from Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Or Proverbs 1434, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin, yeah, sin is a reproach to any people. Now, I, uh, I, like most of the other colonists, resented the taxation that was coming our way, especially when we had no say in it. We had no true representation. In fact, it was the tea tax that uh, pushed a lot of my friends over the edge. And in 1773, they threw a little tea party down in Boston Harbor. But I, I hear that maybe your 21st century generation is a little bit confused about that's why we were fighting. Well, no, you see, taxation without representation was nothing more than a symptom of a much greater problem. See, we understood that we were fighting and standing up against tyranny. Now, as Christians and as a pastor in particular, I knew that tyranny eventually always places its sights on the gospel. If it doesn't start there, it'll get around to it sooner or later. Now, many of us pastors were also engaged at such a level that we were serving in the government, in our own colonies. In fact, I served in the Virginia House of Burgesses with my good friend, George Washington, and the greatest Christian statesman I've ever known, Patrick Henry. In fact, I was there March the 23rd, 1775, at at St. John's Church when Patrick Henry gave that rousing speech. I mean, it was almost like yesterday, it seems to me. I remember him standing there and saying, Is life so dear? Or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, you can give me liberty. And then he made a a dagger motion to his chest and he said, or give me death. And it was quiet in that room that day until finally we erupted in applause of approval. Well, I served in the Virginia House of Burgesses, as I said, while I was a Lutheran pastor. So I'd ride my horse back and forth, and I went back to Woodstock, and over the next few weeks and months, I I thought a lot about what Patrick Henry had said. Oh, we continued to preach about liberty and justice and mercy and grace from our pulpits. But finally, it was, uh, it was just too much for me, and I announced to my church that January the 21st, 1776, would be my final sermon as their pastor. Now, i got to tell you, I was completely unprepared for what happened because the word got out. And that day, the church was packed. Well, I I climbed up into my pulpit because unlike most of your churches today, in our day, our pulpits stood up on pedestals. And so I climbed up into that pulpit and I opened my Bible to the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. That's there's a time for all things chapter. 
I started reading it, verse 1. And then I got down to verse 8, where Solomon said, There is a time of war, and there is a time of peace. Now here I stood, their pastor, a soldier in the army of the Lord. I had preached to them for years. Well, I did something that they didn't quite expect. I closed my Bible. And right there in mid-sermon, I began to climb out of my pulpit. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, there is a time for all things. There's a time to preach. There's time to pray. But there is also a time to fight. And that time has now come. But they really were not prepared for what happened next. Because I began to remove my, uh, my old preaching scarf. And then, off to the side... I removed my preaching robe. And there I stood before my congregation wearing a colonel's uniform. See, I told you a while ago that I served in the Virginia House of Burgesses with my two good friends, George Washington and Patrick Henry. Well, they had recommended me to receive a commission as colonel to raise a new regiment. Now, here I stood as a soldier, not only of the Lord, but a soldier now in the Continental Army. Well, I... I stood there with a pretty shocked congregation. I walked back to the doors of the church. They didn't know there was a drummer boy I'd placed outside. I opened the doors, and he began to play that drum roll. And then I turned around to the men of my church, and I said, Men, it is time to stand and fight for liberty. Who will follow me? I was amazed. One by one, they began to file out of their, uh, out of their pews and outside. And they began to sign that, uh, that muster roll that I had on a table out there. Now, we were going to form the 8th Virginia Regiment. Now, the 8th Virginia Regiment was going to be a, a cavalry unit, so I uh, pulled off my robe and uh, exchanged it for a, for a set of spurs. You see, I was going to ride hard and fast. We're going to fight for liberty. Well, as I told you, I didn't know exactly how my men were going to respond. The congregation did something that just was amazing. Just simultaneously, they, they stood and began to sing the old Martin Luther hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. <laughs> that was a sight. You would have loved to have seen that. So here's my church. Men filing out, signing the muster roll congregation lifting their voices asking God to protect us they knew what was at stake and they understood that we had to stand and fight for our liberties now I led those men in the 8th Virginia Regiment a cavalry unit from 1776 to 1783 we fought at some of the greatest battles in the war we were there I mean we were in the thick of it in fact here's an old painting of General Washington and, and his inner circle of generals and if you'll look to the right there's me Lutheran preacher Peter Muhlenberg, now General Peter Muhlenberg. We were at Yorktown. In fact, it was my men under my leadership that stormed the final redoubt that opened the way for our American forces to rush in and force Cornwallis to surrender. It's kind of funny that day Cornwallis ran and hid, sent out a subordinate. Well, in, in like fashion, General Washington sent out his subordinate to receive the surrender. Very famous painter by the name of John Trumbull painted a painting of that, that ceremony. In fact, I understand that it hangs in your capital rotunda today. Well, Mr. Trumbull included some of us in this painting. In fact, if you'll look there to the right, you can see us seated on horses. And right there, that's me. Now, I'm still a Lutheran preacher, but now I've been promoted. I'm now Major General Peter Muhlenberg. I also understand that you have a statuary hall in your capital where every state, and I cannot believe it, there are 50 now. <laughs> we started off with 13. 50. Every state gets to donate two statues. One for a favorite son or daughter and another one to honor someone from the state. My home state of Pennsylvania chose me. There I stand with my sword right here to my side, a sword that I knew that I had to draw for liberty. Didn't want to fight. It was not within our nature really as preachers and pastors to fight. But there are times when you have to defend liberty. And notice that already off of my left shoulder but still draped over my right and flowing back over my arm and behind me is my preaching robe. I was honored to serve my country. <laughs> 
Well, let me tell you about a couple of other fellows that I knew. This is a Presbyterian preacher. This is James Caldwell. Now, James Caldwell was from Elizabethtown, New Jersey, and he was one fireball. In fact, I, I swear he would say stuff just to infuriate the British. He'd get into the pulpit and say stuff like, there are times when it is as righteous to fight as it is to pray. Well, it, it, it as I said, really infuriated the British, so they put a bounty out on his head. Well, to protect himself, every Sunday, James Caldwell would walk into his pulpit carrying a couple of loaded flintlocks in his belt, just like this. He would climb up into the pulpit, open up his Bible, take these pistols, lay them out on the pulpit, preach, and then when he was finished, pick these pistols up, put them back in his belt, walk to the doors of the church, and greet his congregation. I've often said a preacher with two loaded flintlocks in the pulpit, he takes an offering or gives an invitation. Somebody's doing something, right? That's the kind of guy James Caldwell was. Well, I think you have to know that it costs many of us to, uh, to fight for our liberties and to ensure that you and our children and grandchildren would be free. James Caldwell's wife was killed by a British soldier, by a redcoat, just shot her right through the window. He helped do her funeral. When the funeral was over, his men had gone to Springfield, New Jersey to fight the British. Now, when he got there, he found out that his men were in real trouble. They had run out of wadding for their muskets. And see, the wadding is what holds the, the musket ball down in there tight. If you don't have wadding and you fire this musket, the musket ball will just almost kind of roll out and fall out the end of the barrel. So what does he do? Well, he jumps on his horse and rides down to the First Presbyterian Church of Springfield, New Jersey. And he runs inside and begins to pick up Isaac Watts' hymns. I bet you, you, you sing some of his hymns. There's, there's When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. That's, that's one of his songs. So he has these hymnals. He rides back to his men and begins to throw out the hymnals, encouraging to tear out the pages and use the pages for wadding to stuff down their muskets. Now get this picture in your head. Here's Presbyterian James Caldwell, a preacher, yelling out to his men, tear out the pages, use them for wadding, boys. And while they're doing that and firing away at the British, he's yelling, give them what's, boys, put what's into them and that's the Presbyterian preacher James Caldwell now he paid a pretty high price too because about a year later the British assassinated him I want to tell you about one other friend of mine he, he was a Lutheran preacher he's young he's just 25 on September the 10th 1777 we, uh, we stood on the banks of the Brandywine Creek the sun was just setting and this young 25-year-old preacher named Joab Trout stood in front of us and he preached a sermon to us to prepare us for the battle we knew was coming the next day. General Washington was there. General Anthony Wayne, I was there. And our troops. It was a short sermon as sermons go, 10 or 15 minutes, not real long, but it was a moving one. But he wasn't quite through until he prayed. I'd like to share a portion of that prayer with you. He said, Great Father, we bow before Thee. We are in times of trouble, O Lord, and sore beset by foes merciless and unpitying. The sword gleams over our land. The dust of the sod is dampened with the blood of our neighbors and friends. O God of mercy, we pray Thy blessing upon the American arms. Visit the tents of our host. Nerve him for the fight. Prepare him for the hour of death. And in the hour of defeat, O oh God of hosts, be our stay. And in the hour of triumph, be our guide. So shall we return thanks to Thee through Christ, our Redeemer. But he wasn't quite through. He paused, and then he cried out, God, prosper the cause. Well, by then the sun had set. We went to our tents. But the next day, September the 11th, 1777, we fought the British at the Battle of Brandywine. We didn't win that battle. We showed the British that we weren't going down without a fight, and we, we proved to ourselves that we could stand up against the Redcoats. And oh, my, my good friend Joab Trout, yeah, he fought right along beside the rest of us. And he was killed that day fighting for liberty. You see, we paid a mighty high price for our freedoms. That's what drove many of us, our committee of five, to write a document that was treasonous could have gotten them hanged but we understood 
that liberty was at stake. The concept of separation of church and state, well, we didn't even know what that meant. I still am trying to figure that one out. See, we didn't believe that there were parts of our lives that were sacred and parts that were secular. I don't understand how you in the 21st century can think that way. The 18th century church stood up for liberty. The question is, will the 21st century church stand and fight? Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you have just heard is a little piece of the story of the preachers of the 18th century. These preachers were men who believed the scriptures were literal, but they also believed that the liberty that was a gift from God had to be defended. Let me give you an idea of how these men preached. In 1776, Reverend Samuel West from Dartmouth, Massachusetts, preached a sermon to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Here's a little piece of what he said. It is an indispensable duty, my brethren, which we owe to God and our country to rouse up and bestir ourselves and being animated with a noble zeal for the sacred cause of liberty to defend our lives and fortunes to the shedding of the last drop of blood, the love of our country, the tender affection that we have for our wives and children. Yea, everything that is dear and sacred do now loudly call on us to use our best endeavors to save our country. We must turn our plowshares into swords and our pruning hooks into spears and learn the art of self-defense against our enemies. To be careless and remiss or to neglect the cause of our country will expose us to the displeasure of Almighty God. To save our country from the hands of our oppressors ought to be dearer to us than our lives and next to the eternal salvation of our souls, the thing of greatest importance. A duty so sacred that it cannot be dispensed with for the sake of our secular concerns. He that is so lost to humanity as to be willing to sacrifice his country for the sake of avarice or ambition has arrived at the highest stage of wickedness that human nature is capable of and deserves a much worse name than I at present care to give him. But I think I may say with propriety that such a person has forfeited his right to human society. Can you imagine if preachers preached like that today? See, that's the kind of preaching that the 18th century colonies were hearing. This is why the British understood the problem. King George said, why, this is a Presbyterian rebellion. The son of the British Prime Minister, Horace Walpole, said to Parliament, well, there's no need in crying about it. Cousin America has eloped with a Presbyterian parson. Now, why is it that they blamed the Presbyterians so much? We see in those days, some of the fieriest preachers were Presbyterians. I often say, my, how times have changed. But in those days, the Presbyterians were the fiery preachers and the leaders of the effort. Now, the British, of course, understood this. In fact, it was the American, but a British sympathizer, a Tory, named Peter Oliver, who was the one to first use the phrase Black Robe Regiment, referring to those black robes that they preached in, and the name stuck, and those preachers wore it as a badge of honor. Now, you see, what you're hearing tonight is history most of us were never taught in school. I never taught these things. Let me give you an example. April the 18th, 1775, Paul Revere, riding through the Massachusetts countryside, yelling, the regulars are coming, the regulars are coming. But who forgot to tell me that he was headed to a preacher's house? The preacher's name was Jonas Clark. Jonas Clark was the pastor in Lexington, Massachusetts. With the help of a deacon named John Parker, they called him Captain Parker because of his French and Indian War experience, they'd been training the Lexington Minutemen how to fight together. Well, that particular night, two special guests were staying with Pastor Clark, Samuel Adams and John Hancock. In fact, John Hancock's grandfather had pastored that church year before. Well, Revere rides up and yells, the regulars are coming, men. They invite him in. They have a little council of war. And then Samuel Adams and John Hancock say to Pastor Clark, will the men fight? He said, I trained them for this very hour. They will fight and if need be, die too under the shadow of the house of God. Well, the very next day, April the 19th, 1775, Captain John Parker, this is his statue that stands today approximately where Jonas Clark's church stood, led those men out. Some 77 Lexington Minutemen were actually able to respond to that second alarm early in the morning, and they were standing up against about 700 or so British redcoats. Well, a British officer rode up and said, Throw down your arms, you rebels, in the name of the King of England. 
We don't know what they said, but we do know that a very popular phrase in those days was, we recognize no king but King Jesus. So here were these guys standing there, resolute. Well, Captain Parker, of course, had heard Jonas Clark preach for years that God would only honor a defensive war. So he told his men, he said, men, stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Well, it was just a standoff. Finally, Parker and Clark believed that they had made their point, so they told the Minutemen to disperse. As they turned to walk away, a pistol was discharged. Well, the Redcoats took it as a signal to open fire, and that's exactly what they did. They began to fire into the backs of the Lexington Minutemen. And what was probably nothing more than a 15 or a 20 minute skirmish was the very beginning of the War of Independence. I believe that was the shot heard around the world when the smoke cleared, the dust had settled. Eight Lexington Minutemen had died under the shadow of Jonas Clark's church. Ten others had been wounded. Later on that day, they went over to Concord, which was their main objective. But by then, preachers all over New England had heard about this, and they had gathered up their Minutemen, and they gave the British a warm welcome there at Concord Bridge. In fact, the road leading back all the way to Boston was a running fight called Battle Road today where those preachers fought and they stood against tyranny as, uh, as they uh, worked on those British all the way back to Boston. Now, I was not told any of that stuff when I was in school. See, you got to go way back into history and, and the writers to find this. Now, it wasn't just Lexington and Concord, though, because the Battle of Bunker Hill was just as important and the pastors played just as pivotal of a role. Here's a painting by John Trumbull. And if you'll look right here, you'll see a man in the distance there wearing a preaching scarf. In fact, an enlargement of it makes it a little easier to see. Well, that's Dr. Samuel McClintock. He was a pastor out of New Hampshire. He was so committed to the cause of liberty that three of his four sons died in the war fighting for liberty. He was there with the men of his church. But he wasn't the only preacher who was there. David Avery was there. He was from Vermont. Now, you got to understand that these chaplains were fighting chaplains. They weren't cowards somewhere way back in the back. Listen to what he wrote in his journal about the day of that battle. He said, early in the morning of June the 17th, the enemy attacked our entrenchments but was driven back. I stood on a neighboring hill bunker with hands uplifted, supplicating the blessing of heaven to crown our unworthy arms with success. Amid the perils of the dread encounter, the Lord was our rock and fortress. Picture that. Musket balls whizzing. What's that preacher doing? He's not hiding behind a rock. He's not back in the back. He's standing out there with his arms uplifted to heaven, asking God to honor their efforts. I could tell you about Naphtali Daggett, who was a pastor and the president of Yale. When the British invaded New Haven, Connecticut, you know what Pastor Daggett did? Jumped on his horse, rode up on a hill with his flintlock rifle and started sniping at the British. I could tell you about Pastor John Adams out of New Hampshire. Before the war ever got started, he and his men went and gathered up all the ammunition. They hid the gunpowder under his pulpit. Every Sunday, he's up there railing away with these fiery sermons standing on hundreds of pounds of gunpowder. It's a wonder he hadn't made a spark and blown the place sky high. But I've often said modern preachers would be in no danger because their watered down sermons couldn't make a spark if you covered them with gasoline and threw a match on them. But these guys, buddy, they could preach. Now this is the kind of preaching that these people were hearing. I could tell you about John Treadwell who actually kept a loaded flintlock like this one. This flintlock was actually used at Bunker Hill. It was carried by Lieutenant uh, William Perkins. It's an American made gun. He kept one of these in his pulpit on Sundays when he went up there to preach. He'd have a Bible under one arm and a cartridge box under the other. Or I could tell you about Jonathan French who pastored in Andover, Massachusetts. He literally, when he heard about the Battle of Bunker Hill, went home and got his flintlock and his medical bag and marched off and joined the Continental Army. Over and over and over you can hear these stories. A black robe preacher by the name of George Dufield out of Philadelphia, when the war was over, said this in 1783. He said, as quick as a flash of lightning glares from pole to pole, so sudden did a military spirit pervade those then limited colonies. Nor were those of the sacred order wanting to their country when her civil and religious liberties were all at stake. But as became faithful watchmen, they blew the trumpet on the walls of our Zion and sounded an alarm for defense. Do you see who's leading out in this effort? It's the preachers. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of those who were alive in those days.
Now, to give you an idea of just how bold they were, this is Pastor John Cleveland out of Ipswich, Massachusetts. Now, King George made the British general, Thomas Gage, the veritable dictator of Massachusetts, and he hated the preachers, made it really hard on them. Well, Pastor Cleveland was incensed, and he wanted to write a letter to uh, General Gage, but he didn't know how to do it, so he wrote a letter and had it published in the newspapers. I want to give you just a little flair of what that letter sounded like. He said, General Gage, thou profane, wicked monster of falsehood. Your late infamous proclamation is as full of notorious lies as a toad or rattlesnake of deadly poison. You are an abandoned wretch. Without speedy repentance, you will have an aggravated damnation in hell. I often say, Pastor Cleveland, tell us what you really think, right? Do you realize that that could have gotten him hanged? But you see, he didn't care. Because he knew that liberty must be defended. Now, we've talked about Lutherans and Presbyterians, but all the denominations were involved. Fewer denominations in that day. But here's a Baptist, Charles Thompson. He pastored in Warren, Rhode Island. 1778, the British came in there doing what they normally did, British church. He joined the Continental Army as a chaplain, a fighting chaplain. Now, the British hated these preachers, so if they caught them on the battlefield, they'd do one of two things. They'd either execute them on the spot, or they would throw them on a prison ship, which is what happened to Charles Thompson. Now, a prison ship is exactly what it sounds like. And those men faced conditions on those ships that were just terrible. In fact, during the war, almost 12,000 patriots died on those prison ships. And the number one death rate was among preachers. Today in New York Harbor, placed there in 1908, is a monument honoring these faithful patriots who died on these prison ships. Well, I could tell you about Joab Houghton. He was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hopewell, New Jersey. Now, he was a fighting preacher. He attained the rank of lieutenant colonel by the time the war was over and when the war was over he stayed engaged became one of the early legislators in the state of New Jersey and joined the legislature in fact many of the early lawmakers were preachers now four days after the battles of Lexington and Concord the word gets to New Jersey well Houghton receives the news and he jumps up on this rock which today is part of a memorial at his church but in those days it was right in front of his church and he gathered the men of his church together and here's what he said to them men of New Jersey the red coats are murdering our brethren of New England who follows me to Boston every man in his church went home and got their flintlock muskets and followed their pastor off to fight for liberty in fact that horrible winter at Valley Forge you know who was there Peter Muhlenberg was there. Joab Houghton was there and many other preachers. In fact, I'm convinced it was the ministry of those preachers that held up the spirits of Washington and those troops, kept them together so they could live to fight another day coming that next spring and summer. Now, let me give you another idea of how these guys fought. This is a pastor by the name of Reverend Thomas Allen from Massachusetts once again. Now, he was a real fighter. And on August the 16th, 1777, the Battle of Bennington, Vermont, Thomas Allen was there. In fact, he led his men out onto the battlefield while wearing his preaching robe. He lined up his men, and then he walked on out ahead of them and got out there in the killing zone, jumped up on a stump there, and gave the British the opportunity to surrender before he told his men to open fire. Well, the British returned with a volley of musket fire. Though they missed him, one of them passed through his hat, put a hole in his hat. It infuriated him. He walked back to his men, picked up a flintlock rifle, yelled fire, and fought all day long at the Battle of Bennington, Vermont. A few days after the battle, one of the men from his church said, Pastor, I heard the other day that you fought like a common soldier. He said, oh, yeah. Every man had to do his duty. He said, well, Pastor, did you kill anybody? He said, I don't know if I killed anybody. But I noticed behind a particular bush that there would be a flash, and every time it flashed, one of our men would fall. I took steady aim at that bush, and I fired. I don't know if I killed anybody, but I put out that flash. And that's Pastor Thomas Allen. See, the historians knew all about these guys. In 1833, for instance, here's a magazine that said as a body of men, the clergy were preeminent in their attachment to liberty. The pulpits of the land rang with the notes of freedom. And I always say, would to God, the pulpits were ringing with the notes of freedom today. But you see, they are. We're silent. These pastors, as Paul said a while ago, were asked to preach election sermons. After all the elections were over, they'd gather up all the legislators, put them into one room, bring a preacher in from the area. He'd preach for an hour and a half about how they were going to have to answer to God for the way they governed that next year. You think that'd make any difference, Glenn Mulready, if we do that at the House of Representatives here in Oklahoma? They were also asked to preach to the troops. They were called artillery sermons. See, these guys were engaged to the hilt. 
Here's uh, Frank Moore. He said in 1862, the preachers of the revolution did not hesitate to attack the great social, political, and social evils of their day. John Thornton in 1860 said the fathers of the republic did not divorce religion or politics and religion, but they denounced the separation as ungodly. Now, what are we told today? We're told the exact opposite. We're told if you mix politics and religion, that is ungodly. The exact opposite of what the 18th century founders believed. A black robe preacher who was an Episcopalian, William Smith, said this, Just as the war was getting started, we know that our civil and religious rights are linked together in one indissoluble bond. Religion and liberty must flourish or fall together in America. We pray that both may be perpetual. See, they understood the link. See, our liberties run on two rails. Civil liberty, religious liberty. But if one of those is given up or lost, what happens to the train? It derails. Friends, that's what's happening in America. God set up three institutions to protect truth and liberty. He set up the human family, human government, and the church. But for the last 100 years, we've been telling preachers, you can't preach about the institution of government, even though the Bible says a great deal about it. During that time, government has risen up, and it's trying to destroy the other two. See, that's the time in which we live. That's why the, the, the late Adrian Rogers used to say God created human government. It is therefore inconceivable that God would create government and then tell his people to stay out of it. But that's exactly what we've been doing. Here's a preacher from New York, Henry Beecher Ward. He said, it is sometimes said that ministers must not preach politics. Well, they would have to toe hop and skip and jump through two-thirds of the Bible if they did not. But friends, somehow modern preachers have learned how to do the somersaults and their people are following right behind them. See, we're jumping over the truth. Now, we began with the Lutheran preacher, Peter Muhlenberg, but he wasn't the only Lutheran preacher in the family. In fact, their father, Henry, was the founder of the Lutheran Church in America. But Peter had a brother named Frederick. Now, he was a pastor in New York City. And Frederick was a lot like preachers are today. In fact, he told Peter, he said, Peter, you can't get involved in politics and war. You're a preacher. You've got to stay out of that. Well, Peter heard about what his brother Frederick was saying, and so he wrote him a letter. Here's a little portion of it. Frederick, I am a clergyman, it is true, but I am a member of society as well as the poorest layman, and my liberty is as dear to me as to any man. Shall I then sit still and enjoy myself at home when the best blood of the continent is spilling? Heaven forbid it. Do you think if America should be conquered that I should be safe? Far from it. And would you not sooner fight like a man than die like a dog? I am called by my country to its defense. The cause is just and noble, and so far am I from thinking that I am wrong. I am convinced it is my duty so to do, a duty I owe to my God and to my country. Well, did Frederick see the light? I don't know, but he soon felt the heat because the British invaded New York. And when they did, they came burning and desecrating churches. Frederick's was one of them. He barely got out of there with his family alive. Well, now what does Mr. Fancy Pants Preacher say now? Well, immediately he joined the Continental Congress. And then the preacher who said you shouldn't get involved in politics became a member of the House of Representatives for the state of Pennsylvania. And the preacher that said preachers shouldn't get involved in politics became the first Speaker of the House of the United States of America as one of the original signers on the Bill of Rights. Now, I'd say that's a pretty big turnaround. So what caused old Frederick to uh, turn around? I can tell you, he got pinched. He got pinched hard enough that it hurt. My question is, how hard are we going to have to be pinched? Samuel Adams said, If ever a time should come that vain and aspiring men shall possess the highest seats in government, our country will stand in need of its most experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. Friends, I tell you, that time has now come. The time for us to stand up is now. We ought to be ashamed for not standing up. We began with a clip from the movie The Patriot. Mel Gibson plays the part of a character named Benjamin Martin. He fought in the French and Indian War, and he just refused to get involved in the War of Independence. That is, until the war came to his farm. And then he has to go out and fight with his two younger boys to try to save one of his sons. When he gets back from that little battle, his sister-in-law says something to him that I want you to listen to and listen very closely to what he says in response. I will not fight. And because I will not fight, I will not cast a vote that will send others to fight in my stead. And your principles 
parent. I haven't got the luxury of principles. You've done nothing for which you should be ashamed. I've done nothing. And for that, I am ashamed. I have done nothing. And for that, I am ashamed. Friends, the 18th century church stood up and defended liberty. What will we in the 21st century church do? You see, the time has come that we can no longer be silent. We must stand up. The church actually should be so ashamed that we ought to begin by repenting. Pastors, spiritual leaders, church members ought to actually get on their faces and their knees before God and say, God, forgive me for believing that that's not our job. I want to close with the story of this man. He's Pastor John Rossbrew. He lived in this house out in what was then the frontier of New Jersey at the Forks of the Delaware. There is no portrait of him, but we do have a portrait of his son, James, and we assume that there's a family likeness. Now, John Rossbrew was 63 years old when the war began. Now, that's just a little too old to march off to war. Unfortunately, Washington and the American Army was steamrolled at the Battle of Long Island, New York. And when Ross Brew heard about it, he called the men of his church together and said, Men, we, we can't stay out of it anymore. We've got to go to Washington's aid. And they said, Well, we'll go under one condition. He said, What's that? They said, You lead us. 63-year-old John Ross Brew said, All right. Well, he led his men off to fight, and they actually fought at the Battle of Trenton. In fact, that very first musket that I had at the beginning of this presentation was carried by Private Isaac Cook across the Delaware River and was used at the Battle of Trenton. John Rossbrew was there. A week later, the British tried to retake Trenton in what is called the Second Battle of Trenton. And during that battle, Rossbrew was separated from the Americans and ended up on the wrong side of the creek and in the process lost his horse. Well, he's working through the trees trying to find his horse when all of a sudden he's surrounded by a group of Hessian soldiers. Now, Hessians were hired missionaries, bloodthirsty men from Germany, and uh, they just would just soon kill you as look at you. And Ross Brew could see that there was no way to escape. So he said, men, would you take me as your prisoner? And they just laughed. He saw there was no need to plead for mercy. He was about to die. He said, could I pray first before I die? They said, sure. So he prayed. He asked God to watch over his soul, watch over his family, watch over his church. Then he paused. And he said, Lord, please do not lay my death to the charge of these men. Well, you think that would have melted those old hard Hessian hearts, but it didn't. They jumped on him and they bayoneted him to death. In fact, with such fury that when his body was found, a bayonet was still in his body broken off. And they left him there dead beside that creek. John Rossbrew, 63 years of age, died so that you and I could be free. That black robe preacher named George Dufield, he found Ross Brew's body, and with the help of another preacher, they buried his body in Trenton, New Jersey. Now, friends, that's the kind of resolve that our founders had for us. Now, what are we going to do? Are we going to stand? Are we going to fight? Are we going to speak out? Thankfully, we don't have to use weapons right now. We still have political solutions, and we can get in the debate. But, friends, We'd better get in there, and we'd better stop worrying about offending our tithers. That's why I say it is time, past time, to bring back the spirit of the Black Robe Regiment. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to raise up a new generation of Americans that will stand for the truth. Help us, God, give us courage. Forgive us for not standing. Draw us to a place of repentance. And then, Lord, I pray like Joab Trout did years ago, God, we ask you to prosper the cause. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to share the story of the Black Robe Regiment with you tonight. God bless you. Thank you so very much.